hello and welcome back. Now, don't you just hate it when people talk over you, you can't hear your thoughts, you can't communicate with others efficiently? Well, electronic circuits feel exactly the same way. What I'm talking about, of course, is the phenomenon of crosstalk. And this is something that is more and more common nowadays because it mostly occurs in digital electronics. So if you're curious about what this thing is, how it influences your circuit, why it occurs, and more importantly, how to handle it, then keep watching. So first of all, let's talk about digital circuits and digital communication in particular. I mean, usually it's zeros and ones, but these logical states correspond to some clearly defined voltages. Let me show you a document I found. So this is a nice document made by Texas Instruments and among other things it has this very nice diagram of the voltages corresponding to the various common digital protocols. And the main thing that we're interested in today are the input low and input high thresholds. So for example if we take the case of the 5 volt TTL the thresholds for input low and input high mean that any voltage that the input sees below 0.8 is definitely interpreted as a logical zero and any voltage that the input sees above the input high threshold is definitely interpreted as a logical one. But that leaves quite a large gray zone in between. Now you do have a threshold that here it's defined at 1.5 but in reality this threshold can be anywhere in between the 0.8 and the 2 volts. The exact threshold point will vary with temperature and with parametric dispersion, so you can't really rely on that point. What you need to do is ensure that your circuit clearly transitions between voltages below the input low threshold and voltages above the input high. If for whatever reason you have any sort of glitches that take you into the gray zone, that might be interpreted as a bit that you don't really want to see. So let's see how this would occur in a real circuit. So a basic digital interface would look something like this. You have a certain digital output that will create a pulse. In this case it's going from 0 to 5, so it's a nice 0 to 5 square wave. You have a communication line between the two components. Usually there's also a series resistance present. And then on the digital input side, you have a certain voltage coming into the pin. So this will be the pin voltage that is on the pin of the digital input and then this is interpreted and then you have this turned into a digital signal. So this will be interpreted by the logic circuits that come after this input. And if we look at this we see that our output looks perfectly clean, nice square wave, so does the input. And there's a bit of a voltage drop because of the resistors I've used but that doesn't really matter. We have our clear high threshold and our clear low threshold. Now we can add a bit of external noise to the mix. So what I got here is the exact same circuit, only I added some extra pulses coupled through some capacitors that will be injecting some noise into this communication line. So if we look at this more complex circuit, we see that on the output pin we still have the same square wave, but if we look on the input side, do we see that it's quite noisy. I mean there's all these glitches going on, and this is the noise that I injected with my extra noise sources. And now you may think, well, it's not that bad. But if we look at how the circuit is interpreting this, so if we look at the digital signal now, we see that apart from the nice input high, low zeros and ones that we're supposed to be getting, we are also seeing the glitches. So if the glitch is small enough, then we don't care. But if it's large enough, it will touch the threshold voltage and it will be interpreted as a logical state flip. And this will completely ruin your communication. So if you have this sort of thing going on in your circuit, you will not be able to communicate between two different ICs. And the worst thing about this phenomenon is that it won't always be as repetitive as it is in the simulation. So you might just have one glitch from time to time and only under certain circumstances will it actually reach the threshold voltage. So it might not always be this obvious. So let's see how we can generate this sort of pulses in real life without actually 
adding capacitors and without obviously interconnecting signal sources. So to test things out today, I got this little setup going. So what I got here is a signal coming from the signal generator, which is coupling into my board. Now the board is also supplied from a 5 volt supply. And then I have these various connection points to which I can connect my oscilloscope to measure the signal. Now the exact schematic of this thing, we can see right here. So basically I have four of these stages built. So we have four experiments going on. And basically I got my signal from the signal generator coupling into this push-pull driver. And this is connected to a long line terminated with a one kilo ohm resistor. And then right next to it, I have another line which is terminated with 10 kilo ohm resistors on both sides. And basically there's no physical connection in between the two lines. There's only 160 millimeters of length of wire separated by 0.4 millimeters. So we shouldn't see absolutely anything in the second line. But let's see what happens. So I turned on my signal generator and if we connect the oscilloscope to the output of the first experiment, so this is what we can see on the one kilo ohm resistor. We see that we have our input signal pass through the driver. I mean, it's a bit smaller, but it's exactly the same thing. So no surprises until here. Now, if we look at what's going on on the 10 kilo ohm resistor, well, it's not as clean as we would expect it to be. So if I just increase the signal a bit, we can see that during our transitions, we have certain spikes appearing and these have a total peak to peak voltage of more than a volt. So this is by no means negligible. So what's going on? Why is this thing happening? Even though there's no connection between the two lines. So to understand what's going on, we need to look at the actual physical implementation of the two adjacent traces. So any copper trace on a PCB will have a certain thickness and it will have a certain length and two traces that are close by have a certain distance in between them. Now we don't really care about how wide the trace is. We're only interested in these three dimensions because these basically show us that the trace has a certain surface area to the side. And since the two surfaces are separated by a certain distance, basically we have a parallel plate capacitor. So part of the signal is coupling through electrical fields through the capacitance in between the two traces. Now we also have another phenomenon going on. So if we look at our traces in a different way, we have our signal source which is driving a current through the trace which terminates through a resistive load and then back through the ground. And our other trace is also a loop which has only two resistors connected in between but these two loops are quite in close proximity. So being loops of wire, they have a certain inductance and being close to each other, they have a coupled magnetic field. So basically when one of the loops is generating a magnetic field, the other one is receiving it. Or in other words, we have a very crude transformer built. So some of the signal will couple through magnetic fields. And basically this is how crosstalk works. If you have high impedance traces, like we have in our case, so we have quite large resistors. Most of the coupling is happening through electric fields, through capacitive coupling. On the other hand, if we would have much lower impedance traces, so traces with higher currents, then most of the coupling would happen through magnetic fields. Now, in reality, both of these happen at the same time. It's just that depending on the system, one is more predominant than the other. So to fix this issue, we need to act on the two coupling methods. So we need to look at what can be done for these types of couplings to not be as efficient. Well, the first thing that we could try is act on our aggressor signal. So the signal coming from our driver that is going to our first load. Now, as we've seen, the coupled signal only occurs during our transitions. And since this is a capacitive and magnetic coupling phenomenon, the higher the frequency, the better the coupling will be. Or in other words, the sharper our turn on and turn off happens in our aggressor signal, the more of the signal we will be seeing on our second trace. 
So if I were to act on the slope of my first signal, say increase its rise and fall time, we can already see that our induced signal is much smaller. So we went from a 1 point something volt signal to an 880 millivolt peak to peak signal. Now this can be achieved through multiple methods. So maybe your driver has some sort of settings or you add some series resistors or something. But in most cases you should be able to increase the transition time of your signal without affecting the signal quality. So what else can be done? Well, knowing as this is mostly an electric field coupled phenomenon, at least on my board, one of the things that we could try to do is increase the capacitance on our second line. So we can do this by adding capacitors or in a much simpler way, adding a ground plane beneath the lines. So the difference between my first and second experiment can be best seen if we look at the actual layout of the board. So the first pair of lines that we looked at had a cutout in the ground on the other side. So this is a two layer board and I simply made this cutout. Now for my second pair of lines, the length is exactly the same. The distance between the traces is, is exactly the same, but there is the ground plane beneath it. And basically we can go from the 1.1 volts that we have without a ground plane to just over 400 millivolts. So basically what we've built here is the capacitive divider. One of the capacitors being the capacitance in between the traces, the other being between the trace and the ground. So especially if you're working on a multi-layer board, so four layers, six or and so on, it's a very good practice to have a ground layer right beneath your signal layer. And this will help quite a lot with your crosstalk problem. And also this will help with the magnetic coupling, since the ground plane beneath also acts like an extra turn which will be absorbing part of the magnetic fields. Now of course another thing that can be done is increasing the distance in between the traces. So if the distance is increased, you will have both smaller capacitance in between the traces because of the larger distance and you will have a weaker magnetic coupling, again because the two inductors are more spread apart. So on my third experiment, I have both the ground plane beneath and I also increased the distance in between the traces from 0.4 millimeters up to 1.4 millimeters. And in this case, we can see that the induced voltage is starting to become smaller and smaller. So now we're only just under 100 millivolts of peak to peak signal. So it's getting better and better. But having this sort of distance in between traces is not always practical and anyway it looks quite weird to have a large gap in between two traces. So the final thing that I want to show you is what happens if you fill in the gap. Or in other words, what happens if this gap is filled in with a guard trace. And by guard trace I mean an extra trace which goes in parallel with the two lines and which is connected to ground at both ends. Basically this will give your aggressor trace something to couple to capacitively so it can no longer couple to the victim trace and also we have another extra trace which will absorb part of the magnetic fields. And if we look at what's going on on this trace, well now we're down to just under 50 millivolts. So again the distance of the two traces that we're analyzing is the same as before, so there's 1.4 millimeters in between them, but this gap is filled in with our guard trace. So all in all, if you have this sort of crosstalk problem, either on a PCB or maybe in a wire harness, you could try one of these methods to reduce it. So first of all, if it's possible, act on the signal shape, so try to reduce the slopes. Adding a ground plane will always help with any sort of board, trying to increase the distance between the traces and finally adding a guard trace in between them. So all in all, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos and see you next time. Bye bye.